Well, thanks, Paul, and it's lovely to see you all again. Um, I have to say, this is probably, I don't know whether it's true for you, but it's probably my favorite evening of the year um, because I get to see how you're doing. And although, you know, Will said, uh, it, and Pop gave all those, those uh, logos of different companies, you may have thought that the purpose of this course was to kind of educate you. And yeah, that's a marginal thing. But actually, the purpose of this course is that in the time you guys are going to rule the world. And you will be out there in those organizations putting this knowledge to work. And by God, it's needed. So congratulations to all of you who are already doing that and out there. And I've talked to two or three of you already. And um, hopefully, these few ideas I'm going to share with you tonight will help. Uh, they, they're quite different to anything that. Uh, you got on the course, and uh, I'm going to talk about policy stickiness, super wicked problems, and long graph. And uh, <coughs> this is indeed, as Will said, about long-term environmental policy. Draws on some ideas that I picked up at a conference in Canada a couple of weeks ago, so I try to uh, keep in touch. And for those of you who are not English, I will just explain that Wicked in this context does not mean evil. It means really, really difficult. And long grass is where you put something that you want to forget about for a very long time. And so that's what, uh, what that's about. I'm not going to go through those in, in any detail. This is the academic background to the idea of a wicked problem. It 
goes back to 1973, this paper by Rittle and Weber. And you can see that as you read down that list of uh, bullet points, you can see that the kind of environmental problems that we wrestle with uh, are very much wicked problems. Unique, symptom of another problem, there's no true or false, but better or worse. They don't stop, they're not things that you solve. There's, there's never going to be a moment when we can get up and say, yeah, we've done it, climate change is solved. It's going to stay there and we'll have to manage it, etc. As you would expect from academics, uh, 1973 was not the final word, so we got a second bite at this from a chap called Conklin. Um, <coughs> the problem is not understood until after the formulation of a solution, a particularly difficult kind of problem, no stopping rule again, not right or wrong, novel, unique. Uh, one shot operation, really, really interesting. They're problems that you, you can't kind of experiment, learn, and go back again. You will have done a lot of stuff with Will, I'm sure, on path dependency. And once you do a, a major policy intervention in the climate change or other major environmental space, you've changed the context. You don't go back to the status quo ante and have the opportunity to start again. You've got to take it from where you then have got to. So if we were to do geoengineering with regard to climate change and put uh, zillions of tons of iron filings in the ocean or put... Uh, uh, large quantities of sulfur dioxide in the air in order to control global warming. Uh, if it doesn't work, there's no way of going back. We've then got to take it on from there. I rather hope we don't do either of those things, incidentally, but you never know. And the big environmental issues are examples of those. They're by no means the only examples, and I've put up there obesity, drug abuse, those of you who are aware of what's going on in the United States at the moment about the overuse of opioids. Well, that's another very much big, wicked problem, really tricky. Um, <coughs> this is uh, the, the, the paper that I came across at a conference in Ottawa last week. This is a super wicked problems. I came across this guy, Ben Cashaw, who is um, a professor at Yale and a uh, very, very interesting uh, political scientist. And he's uh, introduced the time element to that. Time is running out, irreversibility. Normally, these wicked problems are kind of long-term. There's no central authority. There's no one who you can say it's absolutely your job to sort this out. One of these characteristics that those seeking to cure the problem are also the cause of it, and there are lots of examples of that. We all uh, buy stuff, we drive, we fly, we eat meat, most of us, lots of us. We all do some of those things, and yet we know that they're problematic. Um, consumerism more generally... These wicked problems often have the characteristics of addiction. And uh, one of the things that you find in uh, our society with regard to these environmental things is that ma many of them seem to be um, uh, kind of uh, addictive and they discount the future irrationally. And we've talked, we talked a lot in the course, obviously, about discount rates. There's a nice little picture, which um, <coughs> I guess uh, if you guys don't succeed in ruling the world in 10 years' time, we will end up in the Maldives Climate Conference um, in whatever year it may be, uh, not solving the climate issue or not managing the climate issue. So we collectively recognize the need to do something about this stuff, but the behavior change implications kind of overwhelm the politics. And we tend to focus on short-term interests instead. Um, I've put a reference there to St. Augustine, and you might wonder what on earth that is doing. Um, the battle we are waging is against ourselves. Some of you will know this, this story may be completely untrue, but it's a nice story. It is said that St. Augustine, who obviously turned into a very holy man at some point in his life, early on in his life, uh, he was very fond of women, and he realized that that was wrong. And he said to God, with whom he had a hotline, uh, God, please make me chaste, but not yet. <laughs> and, I feel, and I feel the kind of environmental issue is not 
entirely unlike that in many kinds of ways, this kind of battle that we uh, wage against ourselves. So, um, and this is what this, this paper was all about. What, um, what, what might we do about problems of this kind? Um, well, progressive incrementalism, and I'll show a little diagram that, that uh, says what I mean by that in a minute. Um, recognizing that this path dependency is not only a bad thing, we're all aware that we're locked into a high carbon high society at the moment, but we need to be aware that every step we take towards a more low carbon society, we're beginning to lock in that trajectory as well, and that's going to be an absolutely critical part of, of getting there. And we, we need to have some sense of where we're going. Um, uh, M many of you will remember the lecture given to you by Dmitry Zengelis, who's a fantastic guy. I mean, he um, is very rare for an economist to say that economists are absolutely useless at forecasting. But what we ought to be able to do if we understand processes by which economies develop and change and societies develop and change, we ought to be able to create scenarios, we ought to be able to make commitments, we ought to be able to set directions and then allow those <coughs> to work out. And for that, we need policies that are difficult to reverse, and that's what Ben Cashaw was calling stickiness, because we know that these things are not going to be solved in one parliamentary term. They're going to have to roll out over a much longer period. They have a long-term perspective. They give long-term assurance and incentives to investors, because inevitably they require investments, infrastructure, etc. And they kickstart these progressive incremental processes which lead to those three phenomena. They become increasingly entrenched. They appeal to an expanding population so that you're building your constituency and they start to have greater effects on behavior. So the question, once we recognize that this is the nature of the problem, is how can the overarching direction of low carbon change be stabilized, avoiding the reversal or erosion of the low carbon course of development? And as we look around different countries, we can see where that reversal happens and how it happens. I mean, Australia is probably the best example, where three prime ministers have lost office due to uh, the climate change issue. Uh, they had a carbon tax that was going to turn into an emission trading scheme, then they didn't have a carbon tax, and another prime minister came in and said they were going to put a carbon tax in place, and the whole thing is utterly chaotic because that carbon tax that they implemented was not sticky. And I'll explain a bit more what I mean by that. And through which specific mechanisms might this policy orientation be instilled with greater stability? And the mechanisms that Ben Cashaw recommends are that you increase the cost of reversal or erosion, the political cost. These are political issues. You encourage the emergence and develop of supportive policy constituencies, i.e. lobbyists. You embed the low carbon transition within a supportive ecosystem of institutions so that you have people working in organizations that regard this as their mission. And obviously, you've got to build societal legitimacy for this. Otherwise, it's going to be overturned. Um, so I'm going to quickly get this, because I want to get to the kind of case study um, examples of this. Uh, stickiness, path-dependent processes. I'm sure Will will have given you lots of stuff on this. Um, the whole notion of lock-in is another way of expressing stickiness, that once you're on a path, it's difficult to get out. It's self-reinforcing because the costs of reversing it rise over time. People have already made investments. There are sunk costs. There are increasing returns so that the benefits increase over time, learning by doing all this stuff that um, you've heard about, uh, innovation, uh, learning curves, the fact that renewables are now uh, in many parts of the world as cheap as fossil fuel is obviously absolutely critical for stickiness because it has, uh, does all this self-reinforcing thing, the increasing returns, and there are positive 
feedbacks. So if we look at a little graph there with durability and the number and size of steps, uh, the classic paradigm is uh, if they're both durable and few steps, that would be marvellous. Very few wicked problems can be solved like that. Very often non-durable change happens and you seem to be making progress and you go backwards as in the Australian example I gave you. So that's no good. Classic incremental is making progress that is then undone uh, rather quickly and doesn't really get anywhere. So what we've got to try to get is this what they call progressive incremental whereby a series of steps, each one is there. It may fall back a bit, but th the overall direction of travel is as we would like it. And, and I now want to apply that kind of, those ideas and that framework to the UK so that you can see what it is I'm talking about. And I will then come to talk a bit about the 25-year environment plan because you can see where we're going with that, how sticky is the 25-year environment plan which was launched by the Prime Minister in January this year. Well, just some examples, and these are, are going to be some slides that some of you may remember because you have seen them, and I've not presented them in the context of stickiness before, but you may recognise them. I'm going to talk a bit about the Climate Change Act and the EU Renewables Directive, both of which you will now know lots about, because they both have very important examples of stickiness. So, the long-term commitments in the Climate Change Act, <coughs> 2050 targets, and 34% reduction by 2020, by themselves, that probably would not have been terribly effective. No politician in 2008 gave tuppence about 2020, let alone 2050. So the second element there, the binding carbon budgets, was absolutely critical to fit that long-term perspective within the parliamentary time frame because each of these carbon budgets is five years, and we now have statutory commitments to carbon budgets stretching all the way out to 2032. Do come and sit down at the front here. Don't feel embarrassed that you're, you've arrived a bit late. There's no point standing through that. Um, <coughs> so you will all remember that, but absolutely classic example of stickiness, the political cost of reversal of actually saying, ah, we're going to give up, we're not going to do this. Well, firstly, it's statutory, it's in legislation, so you have to repeal the Climate Change Act, and there's absolutely no appetite to do that. And as long as it stays on the statute book and you've got this binding carbon budgets, but then you've got the third element, which is just as important. It's no good the government saying, well, we've got these carbon budgets, guys, but we can't do it. It has a statutory requirement to introduce policies, and there is a very important independent committee, the Committee on Climate Change, which suggests what those policies might be. So the Committee on Climate Change doesn't, say, doesn't just say to the government, you know, here you are, these targets, you've got to meet this, it's your problem. It says, this is how you can meet these targets, and this is how we suggest you do it. It doesn't obviously pass the legislation, because that's the job of government, but if government doesn't adopt the budgets and uh, uh, put the policies in place, then it has to explain in Parliament why it's not doing that. And it's not able to say, and this is all in the legislation, it's not able to say, look, we're not, you know, we don't feel like doing it this time, so it's a bit tricky, it's rather difficult, you know. It has actually to give good scientific reasons why it's not doing it. It, ha it has to say why the Climate Change Committee is wrong in the policies that the Climate Change Committee is recommending. And obviously, that's quite a task, because the Climate Change Committee is very expert, and it does a lot of analysis, and it knows much more about the issue than most people in, certainly the politicians and most civil servants in the department. So you can see that this is an absolutely wonderful example of stickiness, a very, very sticky policy. And you can see that the first three budgets have been met quite easily. At the moment, the fourth and fifth budgets, stretching out into the 20s and early 30s, are not being met. And it's going to be fascinating to see how that tug of war plays out between the legislation and the government. 
the EU Renewables Directive, well, that's much less sticky. And um, it's, uh, here's 2008, which is where we were when uh, Tony Blair came back from Brussels and against all the advice of his civil servants, he said, I've committed the UK to sign the Renewables Directive. The civil servants were absolutely appalled because we were here, we needed to get to there by 2020, and this again is a statutory commitment, and you can imagine, they, they, they thought this guy had taken leave of his senses, and, um, uh, but you can see that that commitment and the fact that it was a statutory obligation has meant uh, a level of progress towards the targets that would never have been achieved in the absence of that commitment. We're not there, we're not going to make it. You can see that heat is still way off and, and uh, transport is still way off the levels that would need to be re reached for the Renewables Directive to be met. But what's happened in renewables and electricity <coughs> is truly remarkable in just 10 years. The entire electricity system is on the way to being transformed in a very short space of time. Okay, so to the 25-year environment plan, the government could have enacted an Environment Act. In fact, it did enact an Environment Act back in 2011, which it said was going to be a very important document. It's turned out to be completely unimportant. But uh, it chose not to do that. It's introduced this plan. And um, these slides come from uh, civil servants, who's given me permission to <coughs> use them. And I'm going to make my own rather irreverent commentary on these slides. And you're then going to tell me whether I've been terribly unfair or not. I'm looking for stickiness because I know politicians who commit to something 25 years in advance, it's not worth the paper it's written on unless it's sticky because there will be tough times ahead and if they can, they'll get out of it. Well, we of course are going to start with some nice warm sort of words and uh, there we are, nice pictures of uh, the UK, which looks nice, try to leave the earth a better place. Yeah, well, we can all sign up to that and move on. Um, and here we have uh, our Prime Minister saying something which uh, has always struck me that Conservatives ought to be environmentalists. I mean, it's so conservative, that kind of thing. Mrs. Thatcher used to say that sort of thing periodically as well back in, uh, back in the 1980s. Um, but, of course, as we know, uh, not a lot happened that uh, made things better. So then we've got all these publications that have led up to this 25-year um, uh, environment plan. It's fascinating. Something that I'm going to have to look up, and I didn't have time to do it before this talk. This guy Johnson, back in 1909, I have no idea what this guy Johnson had to say about natural capital. Perhaps <coughs> Michael is going to, going to tell me that. But then there's a, a little things here, most of which I actually do remember. UK National Ecosystem Assessment. You'll remember we did a seminar on that. Then this is the white paper um, for the National uh, the, 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 uh, Environment Act uh, in 2011. This is the report of the Natural Capital Committee, the Conservative Manifesto, and then we arrive at this 25-year <coughs> environment plan. So the one thing you know governments are good at is publishing documents. Um, here we are, the key plan strengths. It's a long-term 25-year plan. As soon as I hear that, I begin to smell long grass. And uh, I was hoping I was going to be wrong about long grass, but we'll see. We'll go through it. It's underpinned by natural capital. Well, that's an idea that you all fully understand. Um, and then there's this fascinating remark about Brexit. As, as, um, I mean, in 25 years, hopefully, no one's going to be worried about these things. We'll, you know, we'll probably be back in the European Union by then. But, but in any case, <coughs> in any case, I mean, who said we were engaging in a race to the bottom? So you can see that there's a shoring up of political positions here. And then this statement from the... I, I was fascinated that, that these slides were, you know, part of, part of DEFRA's slide set for this particular uh, thing. Th then we come on to the framework, which is great. Um, I mean, obviously, who doesn't want any of these things? Clean air, clean and plentiful water, etc. When you read clean air, you wonder 
that uh, the government's lost three court cases on clean air and has been in default of its statutory commitments under the European uh, Union's uh, clean air legislation since, uh, 19 since 2010. So you wonder why they need a 25-year environment plan to meet legislation, legislative commitments that they engaged in, in 2010. But nevertheless, this is all, all good stuff. Policies will focus on this, and um, we, can, uh, we can like that and move on. The whole question of agriculture is going to be, again, really interesting because we don't really do agriculture in this course, which is a bit of a pity, <coughs> because, but we can't do everything. But it's obviously terribly important. And we're going to plant some trees. Well, that's obviously a good thing. This is fascinating, embed an environmental net gain principle for development, because at the moment we have no idea how we would calculate that. And you know we spend a whole module on measurement and indicators and all that kind of stuff. There is absolutely no way government would be able to implement this at the moment, and we'll come to that in a minute. And um, calling farmers true friends of the earth, I think, is absolutely classic. Um, I mean, these are the guys who've ripped out practically every hedge in, uh, in the UK in order to make bigger farms and have put very large quantities of chemicals of all kinds um, onto the land, which gets into uh, our streams. That may be necessary. I've got no problem with that. But as an environmentalist myself, I think that, that's a pretty classic statement. Um, then we've got some other nice things with some nice pictures of uh, birds and animals that we all like um, with... Uh, a, a nature recovery network and um, uh, the, the, the fascinating thing about this is that all this stuff speaks to things that we ought to be doing already. We have national biodiversity plans which are supposed to be, as you will know, which are supposed to be uh, safeguarding biodiversity but are not doing a very good job of it at the moment. So the key question is, well, what is going to come out of this that is not in the national biodiversity plans and why do we need to wait 25 years for it? Um, the obligatory picture of a child um, sniffing a plant. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> this is always very important. And they're going to spend £10 million encouraging children to be close to nature, which is fascinating. If you divide £10 million by the many thousands of schools that there are in the UK, primary schools in the UK, um, there's not going to buy a lot of more pupil contact with nature. Um, uh, and then we come to this fascinating thing with plastic, which, of course, it's fascinating how these environmental issues suddenly emerge. I mean, anyone who's been having any awareness of the seas and the oceans for the last 15 to 20 years knows that there are these massive mountains of plastic floating about. Um, and yet, suddenly, it's the um, issue, of the issue of the year... This is going to be a really interesting resources and waste strategy when it comes out. Perhaps that will be the topic of my little talk next year. Uh, see, see how that uh, goes. And that marvellous phrase, zero avoidable waste by 2050. The quantity of wriggle room in that word avoidable is almost infinite. I mean, like, avoidable to whom, by whom. This uh, consultation launched by Philip Hammond, the Chancellor, just the other day, how the tax system or charges could reduce, reduce single-use plastic waste. Uh, that's a, a topic, as you know, that I've spent a lot of time on, and it's interesting that we need more seeking of views about it. And then this clean air strategy for consultation, for consultation in 2018. And as I say, we've had three court cases for why the government hasn't already meeting the clean air commitments that were supposed to have been met by 2010. Oceans and fish, uh, there and these marine protected areas, so <coughs> set the direction of future sea use policy as we leave the common fisheries policy, okay. Um, uh, protecting and improving the global environment. I mean, again, really interesting, pursuing a ban on sales of ivory. This is something that I'm entirely in, in favour of. I think that's potentially a very important uh, message. Um, it, it's not yet clear whether it's going to be implemented, but uh, we'll, have to, we'll have to see. And, and then you can tell that this, um, obviously this presentation is coming to an end. Um, 
monitoring progress and refreshing the plan. I, I, I'm always fascinated at that thing about refreshing, but we haven't got it yet. I mean, it's not doing anything. So uh, how on earth can it possibly be needing to be refreshed? And uh, you can see that DEFRA is going to work with experts to identify metrics. So there's a job opportunity for all you stars of Ben's GC5. Um, uh, and, and again, we've been publishing sustainable development indicators at least since 1999. Um, and, and you just wonder why we're still thrashing about around the, around the indicator stuff. Um, and uh, then this is the, the clearest statement of what they're actually going to do. And this is where I was really hoping I was going to see some stickiness. Uh, here, consulting, 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 working with local stakeholders, uh, engaging the design and implementation, and there's nothing that's remotely sticky there. I mean, there's no actual commitment to do anything that I can see. And then, of course, uh, the obligatory government saying, well, it's not actually us, our job, Gov, it's um, over to you, really, to do this. We all eat, drink, consume, and travel, well, we know that. Uh, we can all do more to protect and enhance the environment. Of course, we can do that too. Um, most land is privately owned, and therefore it's up to the guys who own it. Uh, perish the thought that the government might like to regulate any of that privately owned land. Um, <coughs> and they, they like this momentum on plastic, which, of course, we all like. It's a very good thing. Um, wonderful quote from Deuteronomy. I mean, who puts... Who puts how, how many of you know what book Deuteronomy comes from? <laughs> yes, indeed. Indeed, it comes from the Bible. It's an Old Testament book <coughs> that was saying you shouldn't chop down trees. I'm not entirely sure what its relevance is, but it wants lots of people to be involved in this. And it's then saying business has a role to play, which is, of course, true. It says it's going to set up a green business council, and it's fascinating because the last government also set up a Green Business Council, and after four meetings, it was supposed to be chaired by two ministers, and after four meetings, the business leaders who used to turn up, they decided they weren't going to turn up anymore because it was clear it wasn't doing anything. It was simply a waste of time. So hopefully this is going to be a little more effective. Where should the focus be? Well, <coughs> there's rather a lot of possibilities there, obviously, and someone's going to have to choose uh, where that focus would be. I, I kind of thought that's what governments did, was that they would have decided where the focus needed to be. Um, some, uh, asking for some thoughts, what needs to be done to get business on board, what sectors, greatest opportunity, etc. cetera. Um, someone I've not heard of there saying some more wise words. Um, so these are my conclusions. Uh, it, it ha by the time I got to the end of this, I, I was suffocated by the smell of long grass, I have to say. I, I didn't, find, didn't find any stickiness at all. Um, you know my views on Brexit, so I don't need to hide them anymore. That, that I found that the whole thing was kind of laced with this Brexit opportunism. Um, and and uh, uh, I give it a stickiness score of zero. Um, there's absolutely nothing in there that would stop a future government simply ignoring this document. And that, to me, is the hallmark of very bad policy. So am I being unfair? I was hoping there'd be someone, one of our alumni who was employed by Bayes, um, and they would be able to stand up and, uh, and say I am being unfair. Right, thank you, Paul. We've got some skin asking questions. Indeed. Oh, your base. <laughs> of course, and I've got the department wrong, and I'm terribly sorry. I don't expect anyone from Bayes to say anything about this. Uh, you do have somebody <coughs> in the he did say he was going to come, but perhaps he's now hiding. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if we get away from the environment plan, do people think this idea of stickiness is a useful one? I mean, when, when, when you come to your, um, you know, the work that you're going to do, uh, I, I hadn't heard of it expressed like that. I mean, I'd obviously thought about the Climate Change Act in these sorts of terms, but actually identifying this as a characteristic of long-term policy 
that you particularly want to design in just you know, in, in order to create path dependence and all that kind of stuff. I mean, can, would, would, would you think that was the kind of useful way to go? Yep. Yeah. I think it's all very different to this because they're saying that the hard the hard way about the kind of trying to push the practicality and how to maintain that. Whereas the the kind of thing that I think I've got on first party before and had a government and had a large majority, but now when you get first party support or you try to connect it in a government partnership, it's very kind of realistically, how do we get any kind of sticking points in whatever level you buy for the actual uh, candidate or staff? Do you do you not think that a twenty five year environment act could command uh, cross-party support? I do, but I don't think there is a uh, successful... I don't think there's a sticking point in taking a cross, a cross party to get that support to sort this out. No, th I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I, I was not involved in the process that led up to the passing of the Climate Change Act, but I'm aware that there was an... because I'm not particularly close to the Labour Party and that we had a Labour government at the time. Um, but I'm aware that there were lots and lots of processes going on and it's those processes which need need to be undertaken rather than these formal consultations I think it would be quite difficult especially with the current Secretary of State I think it would be quite difficult for parliamentarians to vote against a 25-year environment act I can imagine that that I, I mean when the climate change act was passed you probably know there's about 650 MPs five voted against it just Five. I mean, unprecedented in, in that. And I kind of feel that if Michael Gove were to bring forward a 25-year Environment Act, um, I think it would be quite tricky for people to... But, but there's an enormous amount of thinking to be done, obviously, about whether the committee is going to be like the Climate Change Committee, what its powers are going to be, et cetera, et cetera, all those kinds of things. And as you quite rightly say, that work hasn't been done. But, I mean, the Climate Change Act was... Six, nine months late. Uh, this, uh, the environment plan was six, nine months late. They might have done some of that work. But that's a very good point. Yeah, any other, any other thoughts about this? Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, it, the government has a very small, uh, it doesn't have a majority on many, many things. As I say, I'm not sure that it couldn't have built cross-party con consensus on this. Um, there's then the your main question, which is, is this better than nothing? And, and that's a very important question. Is it better than nothing? I mean, the thing is, if it's nothing, then you know where you are. You know that the government's not interested in this issue. It's got other fish to fry. And if you want environmental action, you'd better get out there and campaign for it because the government's not interested. There may be people who take this stuff really seriously. And you say, oh, well, done and dusted. You know, I mean, Theresa May comes up and says that the environment's going to be better 25 years from now than it is now. And so we don't need to do anything. And then if nothing happens, of course, you're not... Uh, in that sense, it's kind of worse than nothing. So I'm, I'm genuinely, I mean, obviously I hope that 
as we move forwards and the government gets a bit more space in its agenda to start thinking about things like that, I hope that elements of stickiness will be put into this plan. Well, we don't need elements of stickiness. There's actually not a single commitment in there beyond consulting. Um, and uh, obviously consultations, all sorts of things can happen. So I'm in two minds as to whether this is better than nothing. And I think, um, and this is my conspiracy theory, and you're welcome to reject it, I actually think that the environment has been identified as potentially uh, an Achilles heel of the Brexit process. All sorts of green types think that the European Commission Union has been good for the environment. Certainly things like air quality is absolutely is the case. And that a, an important part of the whole Brexit plan was to loosen the environmental regulation and enable us to engage in free trade deals that wouldn't require some of the regulations that we currently have on environment and farming, et cetera, et cetera. But that there are people suspicious of that, and therefore you see these pro-Brexit statements here trying to reassure the people that that is not going to happen. But without stickiness, there's absolutely no guarantee that that's going to be followed through at all. So, so you know, there's a lot of politics going on there, which makes me very suspicious. <coughs> Great. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I think we'll move on now to our panel of um, alumni <coughs> speakers uh, who will uh, say a little bit about what they're doing uh, now and who they are, uh, and then provide some reflections on, on this kind of business of long-term policy uh, and stickiness in the context of the International Energy Agency, uh, Aurora Energy Research and the Alan MacArthur Foundation. So, Jesse Oliver, <coughs> if you want to come up and take a seat um, along here, and then in turn, I think we'll go with Jesse first, then Oliver, then Jia. Um, say say a few words, and um, then Michael will share. Um, if you're coming in late, there's some seats along at the front.
beginning there and listening out, but um, being the guide you know, for people and specialists in this room uh, when it even needed and who even wrote a group, what kind of headline and commission. Um, so I think in terms of um, <coughs> you know, who it's directed at and what the sort of fluffy, uh, feel-good statements um, are trying to do is important for me to consider. Um, our road to be fair is kind of my gift in that arena of faith. Um, it is the absolute key. So <laughs> if you're looking at your audience here, I don't know, hopefully they made a lot of ripples of the two months of giving and I assume you do, so there's only a handful. Um, for me, the, the difference was the just focus on a lot is what kind of targets, what kind of metrics, um, and, and how they can be measured. I don't know how something like this a year from now in January is just going to get burned away for what the fact that it happened um, besides maybe between the quotes that we just quote. Um, but does that make sense? Without knowing in advance exactly what Paul was going to talk about, but um, I hope they can shed some light on how I guess we at Aurora think about long-term planning. And uh, I apologise in advance. The slides um, they are actually very sticky. Um, there's a technical difficulty, but I hope you'll bear with us. Uh, so I guess we can all agree. I think Paul made a very convincing case about the importance of sticking it in long-term environmental planning, uh, particularly when it comes to kind of setting the overall policy direction um, and the framework and institutions that you need to prevent backsliding. Um, I guess what I would like to talk about is a slightly, uh, perhaps slightly provocatively, the, the flip side of the sticking it coin. Um, so what happens when you're making decisions under uncertainty what happens when you get that sort of technology lock in which might not be so helpful for long term planning? Um, so, I think an, an obvious point I think many of us will know is that we're actually very bad at forecasting disruptive change, especially in the energy market, which is what we at Aurora are focused on. Um, and there are a couple of ways we're bad at that. First of all, we anchor to the past. And sorry to Jesse. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, back in 2011, the IEA 
couldn't possibly have predicted the changes in the economy in developing countries, mainly China, so it really changed the, the coal outlook over the long term. So you've seen over time uh, a continual revision down of the coal forecast. Same with space. Um, sorry again. Um, <laughs> uh, I think it's, it's not sorry because we're, we're none of us are very good at predicting changes which are which are hard to forecast in the first place. So you tend to anchor to the past things that you tend to think the future will be very similar to the past, but it turns out it's often not the case. So we anchor to the past. We like to extrapolate. The other way we get things wrong, oh, just switching it, is we underestimate the speed of change. I think the classic example of this is renewables. Um, if you look at IEA's forecast for solar deployment in the last five years, they've been increased about five five times, a factor of five, which is huge. And nobody, I think, some people would say that we're still below where we should be. Um, same with National Grid; they published their future energy scenarios, and over the last few years, they've been consistently revising it. How many batteries they think will be on the system? Has you know, market developments to date have proved that we're moving in that direction. Um, so we're not very good at forecasting disruptive change, and but there are different types of uncertainty in the market. Um, and I'm going to borrow from uh, a very unpopular Secretary of Defense in the US. Um, first of all, we have the known knowns. So I guess I would define this here as technology which is very established. We know it exists. It's probably been around for a long while. But perhaps underlying market conditions change, which make uh, things become very different very quickly. Classic example of that is, is gas usage from sophisticated engines. I think probably five, five to ten years ago, nobody really knew what a gas sophisticated engine was, even though we've had them for, for decades. Um, everyone thought the future was big gas CPUs. Um, in fact, there was an article that came out, uh, I think, 2012 in The Telegraph, which said, the gas for gas means that uh, in the next 20 years, we're going to have 30 new CPUs on the system. Uh, that article has really not aged very well. I think we'll be lucky to see one or two big ones in the next 10 years or so. And what we have seen instead, especially after the introduction of the fraction market, is a lot of these very small uh, gas and uh, crude as usual engines. Oops. Then we have the known unknowns. So I guess this is technology that we know about, but that may improve rapidly. Um, so batteries would be a very good example of this. Uh, we know they exist. We know that they're improving rapidly, but the how much cost can come down and over what time frame is still quite a big uncertainty. <coughs> we think it's <coughs> planned for <coughs> future factors. And the third, and probably the hardest to plan for policy-wise, is the, the unknown unknowns. So by definition, things that we just really haven't thought about. Um, maybe a good example of that was the shale boom in the U.S., uh, which completely changed the energy landscape, not just in the U.S., but globally, uh, something that was very hard to predict. I can't, I don't know what else would be in there, maybe something like fusion or, or blockchain, although I think we do know about those already. Um, so all of these things, I think, make it very hard to plan. And if you put in, there's, it's one thing to put in place uh, kind of an overall or overarching policy framework, which gets you, sets the, sets the goal and sets the where you want to get to. It makes it very difficult when you come to the, the kind of nitty gritty of policy implementation. Um, I'd just like to do a quick poll, um, which may kind of uh, bring some of this to life. So, in the future, who here thinks that a generally decentralized energy system, so I'm, I'm thinking things like small microgrids, people developing, you know, solar panels on their roof, um, uh, everyone generating electricity, maybe pay, trading by political software, versus a system more akin to something we have now, central operator, Dispatch, making dispatch decisions. So who thinks that a, a genuinely decentralized electricity system is likely? <laughs> Show of hands. Uh, <coughs> very vague. So next, next 30 years. Quite a good number of people. And who thinks it's unlikely? Um, okay, so I'd say it's about two-thirds to one-third. And so I guess the point you know here is... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> which perhaps makes it even harder to plan for. So I guess the point here is, if if we are all policymakers today, and we do have a lot of policymakers in the room, 
how do you check the direction when you don't really have a consensus about what, what the future might or even should look like? Um, another example oh, would be um, heat and transport. So again, hybrid is probably most likely, but um, in by 2050, do you think um, electrification of heat and transport is likely or unlikely? Who thinks likely? Un unlikely? Interesting. Uh, I mean, so just from a, a project we've been doing with, uh, we've been advising the National Infrastructure Commission on uh, what are the UK's energy infrastructure needs over the next five years, and specifically that these are <coughs> you know, assets which have very long lifetimes. Um, you don't know how the future will develop. They're very interested to, to think through, do we want a hydrogen-based economy or do we want an electricity-based economy? What do we need to do as the NIC to encourage those things in the long term? And if we get it wrong, um, what are the implications for the energy sector? So I guess the conclusion is that uh, stickiness in some, some ways is very good, but other ways um, you do want to think about avoiding this washing. So yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I really want to say you guys are so lucky because you are here and we have Paul Atkins and we have Will to be help you write a good reference letter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, so my job actually is, yeah, we can start with the from this one. Um, it's partly my job, um, plastic, single-use plastic. So actually, Ella MacArthur has been doing um, business around circular economy, but we are we are not a consulting firm, uh, we are not think tanks, we are charity. So all the project is funded from our, our philanthropy. And so why the plastics? So what we would like to do is help, you know, so from, let's start with the from the circular economy. So I think a better way to explain circular economy is to compare with the linear economy. So which is like currently predominant economy mode. Um, we, you know, we extract the resource from nature and then we make something out of it and we use it for a while and then we throw it away. Like this one. I think most of this plastic 
you are still going to be free away from that. Um, so that is the linear way. And then all those weights will either end up at land zero, or some of them recycled, or some of them just burned. Um, there is a data like it's now only 9% of the waste got recycled. So it's quite, quite low. So what we have been doing is how to like, design a circular economy which could design out waste and then make sure because everything, all the products is designed and then all the materials within um, could eventually valorize and then could be kept at the high utility for their whole life. Um, yeah, so that is basically the idea. And then I joined the Animal Health Foundation because there is a new China project. So when everyone talk about China, ah, China, fascinating, a lot of things going on there. So that's why they also um, kind of like want to enter into Chinese market. And uh, obviously I'm a Chinese, I speak Chinese. I communicate with local government and various stakeholders. So um, I just lucky got into the project. So the project is started from um, a year up, a year and a half ago. It first is founded by MAVA. Some of you might heard of this um, MAVA Foundation. Um, so the first project is a research project. So basically, we deep dive into five focus area in China, which include built environment, mobility, tactile, electronics, and the food. And we'd like to know the circular economy opportunities in those five areas. So uh, we, we've, done, we, we've also done some modeling, some 3D modeling <coughs> around those five areas, and to quantify the economic benefit as well as the environment benefit. Um, so that is the first first report, and we're going to launch the report this year uh, in World Economy Forum in China. So the summer, because in Davos every winter they have the winter Davos, and also they have uh, at the summer 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 West meeting, which will be held in Dalian in China this year. So uh, we're going to launch our report there, and after this research, um, we realize yes. There is a lot of opportunities in China, so we'd like to do something, not only stop at paperwork. And then we got another five years of funding, also from MAVA, um, which is which is like to allow us to do some concrete and tangible project in China. And it's going to have like four different areas. So first is we'd like to build up a case study library, which is kind of like open, uh, mutual, mutual dialogue platform. We had to, we like to bring in some good practice from Europe into China, but also bring some good practice in China to hear, so sorry, from China to hear. Like lots of sharing economy has been happening in China, and al also lots of innovative business model. Um, and the second one is we focus on different material flow, uh, it's kind of in line with our research. So we're going to focus on uh, food, yeah, food waste first. And second is going to be tactile. And third is the e-waste. So those three material flow. And also we're going to focus on education. Because we, we think education has always been the <coughs> focus of Animal Health Foundation. <coughs> We'd like to work with um, local, uni like local universities to bring circular economy into their curriculum. Um, and the fourth area, basically, is with business. Because um, sometimes when we think about like who would be the most important people to change the economy, so we would say mostly driven by business. Um, so for, for consumers, how much do they understand circular economy? It's, it's, it's kind of irrelevant. But consumers need to be offered opportunities to allow them to shift from the linear economy to the circular economy. So basically, it's more like, so what we want is, um, is shift from ownership to asset, which means 
before everyone owns something. We buy something, we own it, but we just put it somewhere and we use it once in a while. But now we'd like to promote this kind of like a sta uh, performance space or access space is called <coughs> which means you can rent your stuff. But there is an uh, instrument in China, it's called the white closet. So what they're doing is they set up the renting, the dormant renting platform. So every you, you basically subscribe membership <coughs> and then you got your clothing from that platform. And they provide a very, very decent clothes for young professionals. And you don't have to worry about the clean them, wash them. You got everything delivered. And then if you want something new, you call them again. And then stop them, stop them, come to your door, pick it up. And they have professional cleaning system to clean it. So instead of owning like 10 different styles of clothes, what you need to do is decide what you want to rent, right? So, um, and this is very in line with like Chinese living or maybe um, Asian living philosophy, which is less is more. So you own less, but you have more access to more things. So think about for young professionals, they really don't have time to afford 10 different like Prada or nice dress, but they can easily rent one for themselves. Uh, yeah, so that is what we're gonna do, like a business. <coughs> Because there are a lot of small business happening in China, but think about China is massively big. Population is also massively big. Um, how could we roll out those good practices? So this is what we want to do in the next four years. Um, yeah, and uh, we are hiring people. <laughs> 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 and also had a some team, um, yeah, more information that you can go to Anna Park Foundation website. Um, yeah, so that's basically what I've been doing now. Um, and uh, yeah, it's fascinating to hear um, Professor Paul's lecture again. And it makes me think about climate technology in China and uh, if, if I would be allowed to store that policy in China, I'd probably give minus five. <laughs> 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 very, very mean, sorry. Uh, yeah, there is something good, um, but the thing is, for example, the climate change policy, it was first led by um, Ministry of Environment Protection around 15 years ago. And then um, it shifted to National Development and the Reform Ministry. And then this year, uh, it just uh, reshuffled again. Because this year, Chinese government, they have a massive reshuffle among all the ministry, all the ministry. So now they established a new one, which is called Ministry of Ecological Environment. So basically, climate change, uh, air pollution, and ocean plastic, all the issues go into that Ministry of Ecological Ministry. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry, uh, Ministry of Ecological Environment. So that's just makes me think because in China doing business is quite different. There is really no business at all. Um, it all depends on the ministry. So normally we only set like, that's why we, we only have five years plan. We always do five years plan and then another five years plan. It's because the minister could stay in place for maximum five years. Um, so that is what I feel like is quite crucial for the climate change policy. And not only that one, also for circular economy policy. It starts from environment ministry and then move to um, national reform and development ministry. And hopefully it will stay there for a bit. Um, yeah, um, but another change for the Chinese government is probably some of you might be new. So our president, Jinping, uh, we just uh, changed the position. So he could stay as a, yeah, as a president as long as he wants. So it's kind of like that took them a long time, but hopefully he will stay to provide some good things. Hopefully. <laughs> that is my, yeah, that is my personal reflection upon that. <coughs> yeah, that's 
Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
that the, I mean, from a plan perspective, when you're when you're trying to implement more courses, it becomes very difficult. So I don't know if you're, if you're to do calm and you've got positions for planning permissions for from two different electric power companies for their individual types of charger, um, which one do you go for? Do you have to make that decision for, for one of them? What if you have five companies? Um, or what if, um, in fact, it's not even a charging point, it's uh, a PV to live at the road um, with another technology where you can charge at traffic lights while you're waiting? Or what if then hydrogen becomes the, the right solution? I'm just saying that when the devil's in the detail, then it becomes very tricky to sort of navigate that world. And modeling can help, but um, it's very important to be able to do that. Yeah, it's a very different thing because it's it's not um, it's not a green field document. The most remarkable thing about it is, and we co we did cover this in the course, but but it was extraordinary how uh, how clear it is in the document is that decarbonisation, clean growth, mainly decarbonisation, but not exclusively. There's a bit there about resource efficiency, resource productivity, circular economy stuff is an economic opportunity. That's a revolution. That's a revolution. And if the, if the base civil servants and the politicians who instruct them really believe that, and it's not just a, a rhetorical flourish, then it could be very sticky indeed. Because uh, what we, the one thing we know they're committed to is growth and jobs. Everyone's committed to growth and jobs. If they think they can get that through the low carbon route, and the clean growth strategy is full of that, then then that's going to happen, and um, and that's going to be very exciting indeed. So you'll have gathered I have a quite different view of the clean growth strategy than I do of the 25-year environment plan. But the industrial strategy has got one of those one, one of those things, and um, that's really important that Bayes came out and said the clean growth strategy. I mean, again, thinking back to Dimitris Angelis's lecture, so much of the future is waiting to be invented, and it's it's you know not at all certain where we're going to go. But for Bayes to say that's where we're going because that's where we think jobs and growth are to be, and everyone knows they want jobs and growth then, I mean, that is really important. That is part of the future creating process that, that is, is just terribly exciting. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I think that's a, that's a very good point. I think we've had um, uh, a lot of angry clients over the last couple of years um, trying to grapple with the latest policy changes that have been thrown their way. Um, I guess the classic example was triad completion or the people can't do it, so it's going to be that triad tenant. Um, changes to the capacity market, it seems a lot of uh, interconnectors don't do the time. A lot of people are not particularly happy about that. Thank you. 
factories reopened and shut down and the country just pretended to go to the left. Um, so yeah, it, it is very challenging to create kind of a, a stable policy framework in which investors are confident and then they invest in the back of it. Um, maybe it's a question to throw back to you and your, your invest right talk. <coughs> How do you guys think <laughs> Mine <laughs> happens so fast. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Um, I, th I think the point I was just trying to make was really like what Oliver was saying. I think <coughs> if you can't really then try and actually monetize the politics of policy making and the changes that are involved in the um, I think that for someone like me, where I see quite a lot of <coughs> what's happening in other um, governments and what other people have been implementing. Um, I think also it, it comes down to what we call limited backing. Um, what we're seeing a lot of recently is private sector um, efforts to shift money away from um, this type of energy efficiency um, to think about investment and, and less energy efficiency, which can be approached to very low fees, so fees with a very risky investment. Um, private sector banks um, or banks are starting to fill the gap with their own standards that energy efficiency won't be great um, and things that, you know, they're stepping up and, and sort of adapting international standards. Um, something like climate bonds, um, you know, a little bit off topic here, but those are international standards that are now being adopted. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of times when we're talking to governments, the number one thing they want to know is what are other countries doing. Um, and you look at the industry leaders like Denmark, a lot of people want to know what Denmark is doing. And we're really interested in the Chinese side of this, but Every time it's kind of balanced, that's the number of common denominator. 
very important to think about the impact of what we've been discussing for the last couple of months. But just let me try and back through the audit now. Um, you know, we've had a fairly big question in that sense on various aspects of the audit play, but what do you think is this slightly generic survey um, on what might go about in buying a place here? Is there anything you'd like to add? <coughs> Thank <laughs> you.